Jesus f***ing Christ. Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Business Blaze. I, as always, am your boy with the blaze. Uh, what happens here? If you're new, is uh, Danny writes me a script, I will read said script, I will be an unfunny f***, and uh, Sam will add some glorious and vintage memes. I saw in the comments the other day, someone was like, Sam, do you, any, do you know any memes that came after 2005? And I was like, Sam, specific instructions, no memes after 2005, because the finest, you know, we only want mwah, the finest vintage memes here on Business Blaze. And in the video today, adverts that straight up lied, because anytime I do a video that's remotely positive on Business Blaze, everyone's like, Simon, I prefer it when you just sh companies. And I was like, all right then, <laughs> I can do that. Oh, poop. I knew from the very beginning that my lunchtime hookup with Barry was going to be a bad idea. Wow, hashtag Simon Whistler taken out of context. For starters, Barry had insisted that we dine in Subway, even though there was a perfectly good KFC around the corner. If someone was like, yeah, we're going to eat at Subway, and there's a KFC, I'd be like, no, 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 you're going to eat at Subway. I'm doing whatever the f I want. And honestly, it would just like, I'd rather eat sand. <laughs> than eat at Subway. If I'd wanted a sandwich for lunch, I could have just rung the bell in my basement and requested a ham and cheese pickle sandwich from Simon. Yeah, Daddy, you can request it. Doesn't mean you're bloody gonna get it, does it? What's with all the shouting? F***ing Charles, get the f*** out of here. F*** out of here. Second, Barry's always skin, so he always end up paying for everything. And it's no surprise that he plumped for the most expensive thing on the menu. At the time, Subway was run- Oh, I know this one. <laughs> it's where the sub- uh, sub- Subway sub- uh, you, what, you can- you do- you- <laughs> Subway's, uh, sandwiches, they're like, yeah, it's a foot long. And then it was like 11 inches or something. Uh, the time Subway was running the popular foot long sandwich, which was getting heavily advertised on TV and probably whetted Barry's appetite. 12 whole inches of sandwich piled high with all the usual Subway soy and shite chicken made from at least 41% chicken. But when we sat down to eat our lunch, it became clear that Barry had another agenda. He whipped out a tape measure and started carefully measuring the foot long sandwich from end to end before jumping in the air and waving his arms about in blind fury. I knew it! He screamed to everyone else in the diner. Those lying bastards! I, I, I added that for dramatic effect. Barry dramatically announced that his footlong sandwich was in fact only 11 inches long. And it turns out he wasn't the only one getting served with sandwiches that fell short of the footlong mark by a whole inch. In 2013, disgruntled Subway customers in the US filed nine class action lawsuits against the company for serving substandard Subway sandwiches that were shorter than advertised. I, I don't get how this is a, 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 a like a, a suable thing, right? So what are you gonna do, like class action? Let's even say that you theoretically ate a thousand Subway sandwiches. Oh, say you had Subway sandwich for every meal for a year and you ate 3,000 of these motherfuckers. Well, you'd probably die and your body would mostly be made out of soy protein. But okay, so a thousand sandwiches, let's say each one, like you got the $5 foot long special or whatever it's called. And so you're missing 10% of your sandwich. So you get 50 cents for each one. So you're suing someone for at the best case, $500. And that's if you ate Subway for every meal for an entire year. Why don't just, just complain to the advertising commission, they'll find Subway, and that's how we do it. That makes sense. It was all a bit silly and pointless, really. It was revealed that the vast majority of foot-long sandwiches are indeed a foot long, but due to natural variability in the baking process, some will come out a little shorter and wider than others, even though they all weigh exactly the same and use exactly the same amount of ingredients. Despite this, Subway initially agreed to a settlement of half a million dollars and vowed to take measures to ensure all future measurements of their sandwiches would measure up to the proportions. Wow, at first I was like, when I first, you know, because I don't read the news, but I'll see the headline and I'll be like, oh my God, Subway, that's terrible. And then you're like, oh no. Okay, so people are just, just, I know I, I know I express my surprise about this quite often, but again, it's, it's really just shocking to see the media blowing something out of proportion like this. I just, you see it so rarely in the media, just things being blown out of proportion, just so unusual. Most of this money would have ended up in the pockets of the lawyers, though, who were clearly just taking the piss. You know how it is with lawyers? Give them a missing inch and they'll take half a million dollars. The settlement was later deemed a racket by a Chicago federal judge, and the settlement was ultimately rejected by an appeals court. In this case, it's not often on business plays that I'm like, I'm on the side of the company on this one. In this case, this is right. 
this. And all of this didn't seem to have too much impact on my mate Barry, who still scoffed the entire 11-inch sandwich before going back to the counter and ordering a couple of caramel muffins on my tab. F***ing Barry, am I right? I'm getting all tangled up in this giant ass cable again. I think I could have a future in like corporate mediation. You know, like when a company has a dispute with someone or something and before they go to court, they can agree to it being mediated. I'd say I'm quite fair. And I'd be like, okay, you know, normally you'd just be like, ah, oh, f*** the company. I'm like, no, Subway's right on this one, f*** it, guys. If you need a, a corporate mediator with zero experience, and a half a law degree, you know who to call. Subway's alleged missing inch seems pretty mild when compared to some of the other fibs and fabrications that have popped up in advertisements over the years. Some companies have told porkies that would have made Pinocchio's nose grow a foot long, or at least 11 inches. But a boom boom you're new here, sometimes that happens. Wrigley's Eclipse Gum. I find it hard to trust chewing gum at the best of times. All right, Danny, someone's got trust issues. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to go through several packets of Wrigley's Juicy Fruit in a week. It wasn't a habit. I could stop any time I wanted. I just did a bit of bum bum tss, but, uh, pfft. But I was always warned by my ill-educated parents that I should never swallow it, as this could be incredibly dangerous and I would drop dead. That's just a lie. Chewing gum is digested like any other food. You can swallow it all you want, if you're a disgusting individual. Of course, it's generally a good idea not to swallow chewing gum. Oh. But I think they were exaggerating the risk just a little bit. It's often claimed that swallowed gum sits in your stomach for seven years, but this is just hogwash. Although it can't be digested, it still usually comes out pretty quickly. Wait, I thought it could be digested. Or it could be broken down at least. I don't know. I'm not gonna look it up. Maybe some scientist will be in the comments being like, oh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Enough. None of that, thanks. Heart. So, on the day when I accidentally swallowed a piece of Wrigley's Juicy Fruit, there was really no need for me to run around the garden in a blind panic, screaming and wailing that I was going to die. I'm very familiar with your wails, Danny. Free Danny. Join my pyramid scheme. You shut your dirty mouth. When Wrigley later launched their new Eclipse chewing gum and breath mints in 1999, the TV commercials and packaging made a few claims that were equally hard to swallow. But a boom boom tss. They reckoned that most of the gums just mask bad breath. We kill the germs that cause it. People believe this. Wrigley was claiming that the natural magnolia bark extract ingredient found in their Eclipse gun gum had been scientifically proven to kill germs that cause bad breath. But although their scientific research showed promising results, the research was far from complete, and the National Advertising Division noted significant methodology flaws in their research anyway. It was to prove to be a hideously expensive mistake for Wrigley, as although they admitted no wrongdoing, they agreed to settle a $6 million class action lawsuit, which alleged that customers had been misled. Where's that $6 million going? Is that going to the customers who are like, well, you said you'd kill my bad breath and, and you didn't, and therefore I deserve $6 million? America. What the f***? I'm, I'm assuming this is America. Uh, that's not to mention the $67 million that they'd spent on a massive marketing campaign, which now had sadly been eclipsed by particularly stinky media coverage generated by the allegations. But on that side, I'm like, well, you chose to spend $67 million advertising that something that wasn't proven, didn't you, Wrigley? That's on you. Years later, the research into the benefits of magnolia bark extract is still ongoing. We'll let you know how that pans out. In the meantime, maybe just try cleaning your teeth every now and again. Yeah, it's good advice. It's just like, I don't know. If you've got bad breath and it doesn't go away when you start stop brushing it, go to the doctor. And they'll be like, oh, well, you've got some terrible disease. So either way, I mean, it's kind of a lose-lose, to be honest. I'm not really sure where I'm going with this one. Let's move on. Airborne immune support supplements. I have a supplement to protect you from 5G. And Ebola. No! No! Help, please. What happened to my legs? You can't see this. But he managed to land perfectly standing up, which is incredible. And now I feel bad about ripping his face off. Daddy, chill. What the hell is even that? I don't think we got airborne dietary supplements here in the UK, and I certainly would have remembered the dire TV commercials from the noughties if I'd ever seen one. The product was brewed in the 90s by a school teacher from California called Victoria Knight McDowell, who enjoyed mixing up chemicals of herbs and vitamins in her spare time. The original product was one of those tablets that you plop into a glass of water to create a fizzy drink packed with essential herbal extracts, amino acids, antioxidants, electrolytes, and vitamins. 
Airborne had very humble origins, as Victoria started selling the magic fizz to local drugstores. But by the turn of the millennium, Airborne had bubbled up into something of a surprise success and was available in major chains right across America. Oh no. People love all this fake shit. Is that, yeah, herbs. <laughs> Woo! Didn't we get over this shit when we got over like fing witches? And I don't mean the herbs actually do something, I mean like all the bullshit herbs. And all ETA's shit. Charles. Uh, the range has now expanded to include chewable tablets, lozenges, and gummies, and Victoria had hired a cartoonist to create a lively brand and packaging featuring a sharply dressed cartoon man who came to life in the new TV commercials to explain the benefits of a product which rapidly became known as the one designed by the school teacher. Yeah, because like I always go to my school teachers for for medicine. Jesus Christ, people, come on. What the fuck are we doing? But what did Airborne actually do? Let me guess. Nothing. Well, according to the cheerful cartoon man in the shitty commercials, Airborne was the easy, great tasting way to support your immune system. Each serving contained 13 vitamins, minerals, and herbs. It sounds like KFC, except less delicious. But with particular emphasis on the blast of vitamin C, which doesn't actually improve your immune system at all. Oh, this is one of my favorite, like, dumb people things. Where they're like, actually, Simon, if you were to take large doses of vitamin Cs, it's been shown to, like, cure the common colds. And I'm like, well, that's just a lie. That is just a goddamn lie. <laughs> and anyone who tells you different is dumb. Hashtag cancel Simon. Smash. Look, look, look. If you're here and you believe that, there's a button below this video which uh, I'd invite you to press. I don't need dumb people watching this. It brings down the average of all the smart people here. Like Peter. Thanks for watching, Peter. One day I'm gonna say a surname and there's enough people watching nowadays that statistically one of you is gonna have that full name and it's gonna freak you the fuck out. Greg Jones. Comment below, Greg, I'm watching you. Interestingly, while the cartoon man is delivering his spiel, a little text caption pops up on the screen to inform viewers that these statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. <laughs> I love this shit. It's like business plays, clinically proven to make you smarter. And then Sam underneath <laughs> just have a text here that says, absolutely not a guarantee in any way. Definitely not even mentioned by the Food Administration and Drug Administration. And there was no legal requirement for such an evaluation anyway. The products were sold as dietary supplements rather than drugs. But the Federal Trade Commission certainly wasn't happy with the claims that Airborne could support your immune system as they weren't backed up by any competence or reliable scientific evidence. Again, what a massive surprise. A chap called David Shart, a uh, spearheaded, isn't a shart when you fart and uh, a little bit of poo comes out? Am I just imagining that? Oh, poop. Uh, a spearheaded a class action lawsuit against the company, in which he also enlisted the help of the Center for Science in the Public Interest. The allegation was that Airborne, oh no, the shark guy's the hero. The allegation was that Airborne was little more than a placebo effect wrapped up in false claims. Airborne admitted no wrongdoing, and I'm now becoming increasingly aware that in a script entitled Adverse That Straight Up Lied, I've covered two stories in a row from companies who never, who claim they never lied. So let's just be clear that Airborne never lied about anything. <laughs> I'm getting the feeling the next line is begins with a but and I haven't seen it yet. I lost my place. But they did agree to pay around $30 million to settle the FTC charges in the class action lawsuit. So they didn't lie and uh, they did reach very expensive settlements <laughs> where I'm sure there was absolutely no admittal of lying. And I'd love to think the Victorian Knight McDowell was made to stand at the back of the courtroom until she had time to have a really good think about her behavior because she's the school teacher who people went to for drugs. Uh, definitely not lied about herbal remedies, allegedly. Amoco Clear Gas. 1993 was the year that everything suddenly became crystal clear. It certainly was. This was the year that companies went crazy on creating new clear or colorless versions of their products in a bid to persuade customers that they were purer or cleaner than the previous dirty models. I think Crystal Pepsi was this, right? And it was like, yeah, 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 before it contains loads of shit. That allegedly, that's what made it brown. And now it's clear, crystal clear. You're no longer drinking shit, just delicious Pepsi. You can see why this became quite trendy for a while. The world was gradually becoming more tuned to environmental concerns. It was like, no, 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 let's just not put it in plastic anymore. Let's just, uh, I don't know, serve it in recyclable glass or some shit, or refillable bottles, even better. It's like, no, 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 what we're we gonna do, we'll just make it clear so people have the illusion of, in, uh, of giving a shit about the environment. I mean, look, how much have we talked about the environment this year, 2020? Less, definitely less. Because the environment is something that we get to when we've run out of other more pressing problems like pandemics or 
you know, economic recessions when everyone's poor. And I'm not saying that this isn't a problem. It's a massive problem because the environment is something we should be extremely concerned about and we don't seem to see it as a pressing issue, even when it really is. But as soon as something else comes onto the agenda that is like more pressing, it's like, yeah, 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 f recycling. <laughs> In truth, there was usually very little or no health benefits or environmental advantages in these nuclear products. Again, what a f***ing surprise. Comment, customers just seemed to convince themselves that this was the case. So the world was treated to new Crystal Pepsi, Palm Olive's clear dishwashing liquids, Neutrogena's clear hairspray, Clearly Canadian spring water. What color was it before? Gillette's Clear Angel Antiperspirant and even Miller's Clear Beer. That sounds cool. I'd definitely love to try clear beer. The Amico Oil Company decided to jump on this brief bandwagon to lucidity by splashing out on a multi-million dollar advertising campaign for their crystal clear Amico Ultimate Gas. In fact, this wasn't a new product at all. Amico had already been flogging clear colored fuel for years, but the company, oh, like gas, like petrol, I'm like, gas is clear, Danny. Like, it's weird if gas isn't clear. It's like you're either in a steam room or you're getting gassed in the trenches, or. But it means petrol. But who's even looking at that? The only time you see petrol is like when people have like gas station fights, like in that uh, work of art that is the movie Zoolander. Uh, Amico had been flogging clear colored fuel for years, but the company clearly thought that this would be a great opportunity to follow the trend and splash out on major marketing for their colorless gas. However, they maybe should have paid more attention to the fact that most of the other nuclear products weren't really making any bold claims. They were more reliant on customers just mentally associating a lack of color with purity. Crystal Pepsi never claimed to be significantly better for you than regular Pepsi. It was just sold as a caffeine-free and colorless alternative. Oh no, it's without caffeine? Forget everything I said about it. F that. Maybe we could sprinkle some cocaine in the top. Amico overstepped the line when the company implied in their TV commercials that their clear gas was more refined than the scummy brown gasoline of their competitors and delivered superior engine performance and environmental benefits. The problem was that there wasn't a shred of scientific evidence to back any of this up. The FTC charged Amico with making unsubstantiated claims, eventually leading to a 1996 settlement involving an undisclosed but probably massive amount of money, allegedly, and a promise not to indulge in making any more claims with zero emission evidence. By this time, the world had largely moved on from the short-lived crystal clear fad anyway. During the mid-1990s, everyone went crusty again and started going back to drinking dirty bath water and rolling around in horse manure. But a bum bum Pom Wonderful. You know a company is bound to be on dodgy grounds when they start claiming that they can cure cancer or at least claim to reduce the risk of developing cancer. Wait, hang on, I could start like Simon's Hat Company. It reduces the chance of getting cancer because you're not going to get as much sun on your face and then you're much like you're less likely to get skin cancer. Don't know about your logic there, Danny. I can cure cancer with this one quick trick. You don't know anything about this ETA. Please, let me back in. I miss you. Okay, I'll let you back in. Nice work, though. What? Why do you have a skull? Absolutely no reason at all. All right, I'm going to put you at the back, though, okay? Stuart Resnick is an 83-year-old billionaire with a string of successful acquisitions under his belt. He may be getting on a bit, and he survived a prostate cancer scare several years ago, but these days he feels fit as a fiddle and claims he hasn't had so much as a cold in well over a decade. He recently cycled 40 miles a day across Italy during a nine-day bike trip, which I have to admit is quite impressive. It is 83 years old. I'd get a bit out of puff riding a bike down to the other end of the village for a pasty and a pint. So what does Stuart attribute this cancer survival and continued good health? Uh, hopefully prostate surgery and all of the exercise he's getting, but I'm gonna guess that it's actually something else. <laughs> it's magic. Well, he's very keen to point out that he drinks eight ounces of the delicious Pom Wonderful pomegranate juice every single day, along with a Pom Wonderful pomegranate pill. It's worth mentioning at this point that Stuart Resnick and his wife, Linda, own the company. Oh, that's surprising. <laughs> I'm really shocked that there's a conflict of interest here. Weird. First launched in 2002, Pom Wonderful provides healthy beverages, fruit extracts, and supplement pills, which were all developed following the investment of tens of millions of dollars into scientific research of their benefits. Sounds a lot, too. But don't forget, this happy couple are billionaires. I bet he has a really cool bike. 
<laughs> I bet he does. <laughs> now, because Pom Wonderful are essentially just flogging beverages and supplements, they handily escape any scrutiny from the FDA. I feel like this is that First Amendment thing that we talked about in a recent Business Plays video. It's like, yeah, 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 First Amendment applies to books. So you can write all the craziest sh about like 5G, COVID, conspiracy theory motherfuckers in these books. But if you talk about it in like a video, it's like, or you know, in advertising or whatever, on an infomercial, I think was the example, it's like, FDA be coming for you, boy. But um, in books, totally cool. You can be as crazy as you want because First Amendment, freedom of speech or whatever the it is. I don't know. Americans, let me know. I think it's freedom of speech. Hey Siri, what's the First Amendment? Oh, f never mind. Because in 2010, the FDA sent Pom Wonderful a letter warning the company that they were making health claims in their marketing, which had resulted in their range of products becoming officially considered as unauthorized drugs. Oh, shit, that's not a good thing. Amongst other things, Pom Wonderful claimed that their products promoted a healthy heart and prostate, reduced the length and severity of colds, <laughs> slowed down tumor growth, reduced LDL cholesterol, and helped with erectile dysfunction and prostate cancer. Oh my god. Well, at least you got billions of dollars to settle, I guess. But you know. Uh, and despite a total of $40 million getting pumped into all the scientific research at this point, it hadn't yet come up with anything useful, like, say, evidence that backed up any of these claims. The FDA ordered Pom Wonderful to sort its shit out within 15 days. When the warning was ignored, it was the FTC who ultimately took Wonder Pom Wonderful to court. And in 2012, oh, Danny, I really hope they get in trouble. I really hope it's a. I really hope they get shut down or whatever, because otherwise I'm really going to have to edit some allegedly's into this shit. Uh, and in 2012, a US judge, federal judge, decreed that Pom Wonderful had misled its customers, excellent, and ordered them to stop repeating such claims in the future. I couldn't find any evidence of a fine, though, which is a bit odd, especially as Stuart and his wife would barely even notice if their wallets were a few million dollars lighter. Following the order, Stephen Clark, the president of corporate communications at Pom Wonderful, was a pain to point out that the company was committed to honesty and transparency. And he also drew attention to the fact that the FTC had only questioned a mere 36 of the company's 600 commercials. So let's not be too hard on Pom Wonderful. They only created 36 adverts that lied. Allegedly. According no, it's not alleged. The FTC said so. <laughs> Good old FTC. And a federal judge. He's, that's the big judge. Nokia's pure view. Finally. Here is one of my all-time favorite examples of a misleading ad. Even though there were no lawsuits, no fines, and the company was very quick, quick to offer a humble apology. In 2012, Nokia, Nokia, uh, I think one's British, one's American, Nokia is definitely how I'd say it in Britain, Nokia is how an American might say it. In 2012, Nokia released Nokia released the first commercial to show off the revolutionary pure view imaging technology which came installed on their new Lumia 920 smartphone. The amazing floating lens image stabilization technology meant that you could shoot super smooth videos even when being held upside down and shaken violently by an angry biker thanks to the innovative sensors which can detect shaky hand movements and correct any aberrations on the go. I have a device called it that does this. It's like uh, like a steady cam. You can like move along with it and it's like perfectly smooth. It's wild, but it's big. Definitely doesn't fit in a phone. <laughs> they probably should have used my angry biker idea in the commercial, but instead they played it safe with a loved up couple happily riding bicycles by the side of a river. The bloke is filming his girlfriend with perfect clarity on his Nokia phone as they both pedal through the beautiful scenery. I'd like to think that at some point on their bicycle trip, they were overtaken by an 83 year old man huffing and puffing away as he downs another bucket of Pom Wonderful and then screams at the sky in defiance. Fuck cancer! Got my bum wonderful! Jesus fucking Christ. For safety reasons, I should point out that if you're doing something as dangerous as riding a bicycle outdoors, you're probably better off keeping your eyes on the road in front of you and both hands on the handlebars, instead of devoting all your concentration to filming your partner riding a bike next to you. But Nokia was keen to show you how easy it was to film a perfectly stabilized video on the Lumia 920, even when you're bobbing up and down on bumpy roads with potholes. Last page. Come on. They even showed you side-by-side -side comparisons of the footage, featuring non-stabilized blurry versions along the polished and velvety versions filmed with PureView. Quite near the beginning of the advert, there's a scene which is clearly meant to be from the perspective of the bloke's phone and is captioned with optical, optical image stabilization on, so this is meant to be actual footage created from the Nokia Lumia 920. But there's a little clue in the advert which suggests that that might not be the case. As the woman is filmed riding past the trailer, we can see a curious reflection in the window. Oh god, there's gonna be like a full-on steady cam, right? Well, it may not be blindingly obvious at first glance, but if you play the video in slow motion and zoom in on the window, 
and enhance. You can just about make out the reflection. And of course, it's the 21st century, so that's what people did. <laughs> so what secrets did the reflection reveal? You'd think that it would probably just show the guy on the bike holding his cool smartphone aloft, but there's no sign of him at all. Instead, it shows a moving big white van with a lighting rig, a professional camera rig, and a bloke hanging out the back door with what looks to be a high-end steadicam. <laughs> and that's just a little bit naughty. To be fair, when this was revealed online, Nokia made a swift apology. They claimed that the professional shot footage was meant to simulate the PureView technology, but regretted the confusion caused and quickly replaced the ad with an alternative version shot entirely on a Lumia 920. The weird thing is, is that PureView was genuinely very impressive anyway, and they really didn't need to cheat to show off the benefits of the new image stabilization technology. But there's a valuable lesson to be learned here. It's one thing to tell lies in your adverts, which later get questioned and exposed, but, but at least try to avoid leaving tantalizing clues that you're lying in the very advert that you're broadcasting. Otherwise, you're doing every at the poor old FTC out of a job. This has been Business Place. I've been Simon. I'm going to start calling Charles Charles because I'm feeling slightly threatened by the skull. Danny has written this. Sam will add some memes. Thank you for watching. Oh, perchthemerch.co. There you go. Hot.